Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on the topic of weighing up the risks and benefits of complementary medicines for musculoskeletal conditions. I would like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We have one webinar remaining in our 2022 series. This webinar on Wednesday the 7th of December will be on the impact of musculoskeletal conditions on intimate relationships. I'm also pleased to announce the webinars within Musculoskeletal Australia's 2023 community webinar series, which are on your screen now, and also include some great topics covering such conditions as rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, complex regional pain syndrome, and neck pain, as well as current issues such as medicinal cannabis and the importance of sleep. Anyone who registered for our webinars in 2022 will be automatically registered for the 2023 series just to save you the trouble of reg registering yourselves. If you haven't previously viewed Musculoskeletal Australia's website, I strongly suggest you do so. We have our online shop as well as a wide range of information videos, recordings of our previous webinars, tools and services, including our national helpline that is available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. Our presenter for this evening is Dr Geraldine Moses. Geraldine is a clinical pharmacist specialised in medicines information. She works part-time at the Mater Hospital in Brisbane and for the Australian Dental Association, providing the National Drug Information Advisory Service called Pharma Advice. She also holds the position of adjunct associate professor in the schools of pharmacy at the University of Queensland and the University, uh, Queensland University of Technology. She also consults to the Depart Department of Veterans Affairs, NPS Medicine Wise and the New Zealand Dental Association. Geraldine has won several awards for her work, including Australian Pharmacist of the Year in 2002, and in May 2019 was recognised in the Australia Day Awards as a member of the Order of Australia for her significant service to medicine and the community as a pharmacist through her advisory and educational roles. We are extremely grateful to Geraldine for presenting this evening's webinar and without further ado I'll hand proceedings over to her. Thanks very much Geraldine. Thank you very much Jen. It's great to be here and thanks to everyone online joining us tonight. Uh, I'll hopefully run you through a magical whirlwind tour of the issues behind complementary medicine use. I won't be giving a little pharmacopoeia uh, of all the different types of complementary medicines used in musculoskeletal conditions. I'm sure you know more about them than I do. Uh, I, I will cover some uh, and I just want to make sure that I've declared that I have no particular um, intellectual or um, financial or personal conflicts of interest with this subject, but I have had a lifelong or career long um, approach to complementary medicines, trying to promote quality use of comp meds and making sure that people think about both the benefits and the risks. So that's on this slide. I'm not against complementary medicines, but I want to promote, promote informed use because what you often find is in the ads and even on the products themselves, you only ever hear about the benefits and what they're good for, but you never ever get to hear about the potential adverse effects, the side effects, the drug interactions. Um, and therefore people think that these are products that you can take that have no risks. And that's clearly not true, isn't it? Um, so it's time we started to talk about both sides of the equation. And that's why, um, that's what we'll be talking about tonight. I'm Fresco, anyway, there we go. Um, there's quite a delay between me pressing go and the next slide coming up. So these are, these are the sorts of products we're talking about. So I don't mean to mention particular products. I've just plucked those off the internet and eBay and all the different websites that people go to. Um, just so you know, also my work, I still work two days a week at the Marta Hospital in Brisbane. I'm a drug information pharmacist, but the work that I do mostly in the drug information service is uh, answering our the questions from our clinicians in the cancer service. We have a very big cancer unit at the Marta. Uh, because so many of our cancer patients after a diagnosis about a mal malignancy 
race off to the naturopath and feel the need to try complementary medicines. They're often completely unaware and certainly not informed by their naturopath of the potential adverse effects or interactions of these products, just like these on the screen, with their chemotherapy. And sometimes these things can interact such that they can make the chemo more toxic, but also could make it less effective. So we have to make sure people understand those potential risks to weigh them up against the potential benefits and decide whether the risks outweigh the benefits or not. So that's what I mean by informed use, making um, quality decisions. So a bit, little bit of lingo, um, people talk about alternative medicine often, and we're not really talking about alternative medicine here because alternative means a substitute for conventional care. And what we more frequently see is complementary use, that people take these products in addition to conventional medicines. So they're taking them all together. And, and so the complementary, note it's spelt with an E, not an I. So the E is the version of this word that means to go with and complement other things. People often wax lyrical about them complementing your body's own healing powers. I don't know about that. But um, certainly it means that people are using lots of medicines together. And that's why drug interactions is so terribly important. And by the way, I have spent the um, 35 years or so of my career uh, specialising in drug interaction. So it's an area that I'm very... Um, keen on talking about. It, it, I, I very much have studied more than others in this area. Um, some other words you'll hear is people sometimes call them supplementary medicines, natural health products, practitioner only remedies. That actually is a fairy story. I mean, what makes them practitioner only? Nothing. They just write it on the pack and hope that it means something. Um, but you know the sorts of products we're talking about. Um, you see, you would see them in the shops everywhere, in supermarkets, and very much in pharmacies, which is a concern. Um, the problem is that they're out in the front shop. And most pharmacists are stuck out the back, to, you know, dispensing prescriptions, and so they often cannot fulfil their obligations to help people make good decisions about risk versus benefits. And you're mostly stuck with the, you know, 12-year-old pharmacy assistants helping you. Uh, choose products and, and that's less than optimal. So the sorts of remedies include herbs and vitamins, sports supplements, naturopathy, homeopathy, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese, all the traditional sort of um, medicines in certain uh, ethnic cultures and even aromatherapy at a stretch, even though it's not really a drug, but people do tend to use it that way. We're not talking about the touching therapies, uh, massage, acupuncture, Reiki, iridology, because they aren't, they definitely aren't drugs. We're talking about anything that goes into your body as a chemical substance to change the way your body normally works. So, oh, I missed a slide. So just as an example, um, this is actually a home medicines review that I did a couple of years ago. That's obviously not the lady and it's not me, but it's a picture off the internet of um, a pharmacist uh, talking to a patient about medicines. But it's the kind of conversation that we have with people when we do a medication review in people's homes. And this lady was in my local area. She was referred for a home medicines review because uh, as part of the conventional medicine she was using to treat her rheumatoid arthritis, which included methotrexate, sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine, she took a whole lot of supplements, including vitamins and herbal remedies. Um, she told me that she did that because she doesn't like her prescription drugs. And it was really just because I guess over the years, many people had sort of cast aspersions on her prescription drugs going, oh, I don't know about that, but they look dangerous and all that sort of stuff. You get people expressing opinions and it creates fear and anxiety, doesn't it? Whereas the complementary medicines were always presented to her as risk-free and her friends would think she was a bit of a winner if she took those sorts of things. And her reasons for using them were things like to maybe give her more energy, to support her immune system. And I'm using my fingers like this because these are the phrases that people use, but frankly, they're a bit abstract, aren't they? I'm not saying they're not real, but I'm saying they are uh, nebulous terms that you might hear that phrase and it means something to you, but it might mean something different to me. And that's how the manufacturers of these supplements get away with so much because they use these namby-pamby terms. Um, so she bought them. Uh, online uh, based on her own reading and also from the advice of her next door neighbour and actually her neighbour uh, sat in on the whole interview. Um, 
And so her, these are her conventional medicines, including uh, folate that she took with her methotrexate. And if anybody wants to ask about drugs like methotrexate after this presentation, then by all means do so. Um, uh, drug for hypertension, carvizide, and um, you might know there the denosumab or prolia, which lots and lots of people with um, autoimmune arthritis end up on uh, to manage the loss of bone density to treat osteoporosis. She was taking these things, uh, a magnesium supplement that also had vitamin B6 in it. She took a vitamin B6 supplement separately, and I'm not picking on these particular brands, they, they were what she was on. Um, some fish oil, some glucosamine and chondroitin, a thing uh, called liver detox, a product that was essentially, she thought, a really good calcium and turmeric. And she made up reasons for why she took them. But I've run you through them, just so just off the top of your head as a reflection, have you seen those products yourselves? And have you ever thought yourself that there might be problems with them? So just to challenge yourself right now, could you think of three types of problems with, say, vitamin B6? Glucosamine, calcium, what about turmeric? What kinds of problems? So I don't mean even specific, one specific, specific problem, but kind, generic types of problems. If you were, so two types would be adverse effects, side effects, or drug interactions. But I'm going to tell you about six potential harms from complementary medicines, indeed any medicine, but tonight we're talking about complementary medicines. And I would like you to reflect also on where you would go for that information. If you, if you had a prescription drug, you'd at the very least probably be given a leaflet by your doctor or pharmacist called the Consumer Medicines Information Leaflet. They often just frighten the pants off you, but the purpose of those leaflets is to warn you of potential risk. You do not get that with complementary medicines. So if you're not getting information from your health providers, where do you go? And that's the hard part with complementary medicines. Um, so this is what I would like you for to take away from tonight's presentation is particularly to think about how we ever decide something is safe. It's a very frequent question that consumers will ask health professionals, but is this product safe? Is this drug you're prescribing for me safe? So we have to think, well, what's safe anyway? So the definition of something that's safe is not that we can guarantee you that nothing bad will ever go wrong ever, because we can't do that, can we? But what we can do is say, it's where we believe the benefits outweigh the risks. And that's just like anything else, and it's like crossing the road or catching a plane, we're doing anything with potential risk, you, you'll take it on board if you think that the benefits will outweigh the risks. So we should do this with complementary medicines as well. And in order to do so, we need to quantify both sides of the equation. We need to know how much benefit is there. So not just that something is good for you, but how good for, how much good for you <laughs> will it give you? And then how much risk? And that's the challenge for us. And I'll show you how. So firstly, the question we often get is, is our complementary medicines drugs? And a lot of people would like to think that they're not, but of course they are, because a drug, not a bad thing, a drug is just any substance taken into the body to change the way the body normally works. So the emphasis in that definition is change. People don't take complementary medicines just for the fun of it, or maybe some do, but mostly it's to change things, to help with pain, to make pain less to help with anxiety, to help with treating a cancer, to help with sleep and, and make sleep come more quickly or have longer duration sleep, but we're changing things. And you have to put a substance into your body. So I'm saying substance so that we're not thinking it's light and sound, uh, but it's a, it's a thing. People might say sometimes chemical substance, but all things are chemical, even our own body is a bunch of chemicals. And also um, naturalness, well, we don't really care much about naturalness. Um, but basically, lots and lots of things in our lives are drugs, and there's nothing wrong with that. So certainly herbal remedies, vitamins, but also the caffeine in your coffee and tea, and we love that, uh, the nicotine in tobacco, the drugs in your prescription medicines, over-the-counter medicines, alcohol, cosmetics often have drugs in them, and even food could be a drug if you get down to it. So fish is the best example that people eat fish for its drug-like effects, for the essential fatty acids that are in the fish oils to maybe confer the benefit for heart disease and maybe confer the benefit for arthritis. So what is a drug? 
It's any substance that you stick inside your body to change the way it works. They're all drugs, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. We've got to get away from the pejorative understanding of what drugs are. Um, so they're neither good nor bad, they're just tools. And this is what we should teach our children, that drugs are just tools to do a job. So like the tools on your desk, or your tools in your garden, the tools in the kitchen, in the garage, in your work. They're just things that help you do something and probably do it more easily or quickly. So, But it's the way we use those tools that matters, uh, that makes them safer. And in order to use your tools effectively, you need to read the instruction manual. And that's what a lot of people don't do with drugs is that they don't read up on them and don't educate themselves. You, By you coming to this webinar, you're 17 steps ahead of most people because you are trying to educate yourself about medicines. In pharmacy, particularly, we talk about a concept of quality use of medicines, which constitutes safe, appropriate, judicious and effective use of medicines. Um, it's a bit of dinner party conversation for us sometimes, but it's also embedded in our national medicines policy. And we like to uh, adopt the principles of QUM to complementary medicine use as well, that they should be safe, that you should only use them if they're appropriate. You should only use any drug if it's the right thing to do and it's judicious, and you should only use them if they're effective. So are they natural? Well, people say that to me all the time, you know, but they're natural. If you're taking a product like this that's been made in a factory, did it grow out of the ground like that? No. Well, so what we have to sort of get in our heads is that, yeah, sure, maybe once upon a time they were natural, but when you buy them as a pharmaceutically prepared, manufactured product, they're not natural anymore. Echinacea capsules don't grow on trees. Turmeric tablets don't grow on trees. So, um, we have to sort of get over this concept of naturalness because, I mean, look, if you're chewing on bark and eating the actual leaves and flowers of plants, that is natural. That is definitely natural. And many teas are made like that, aren't they? That people will brew twigs and branches and leaves in, in hot water. That is way natural, but still they are drugs in a way. Um, but it's these pharmaceutically prepared drugs that create more potential risk because it's the pharmaceutical manufacturer that can alter them, particularly make them much more potent and concentrated and therefore create like an overdose risk. So that the substances are now much more concentrated than they ever would have been in food or they would have been in a plant. They're now in a pharmaceutical form. So if that's what you're taking, don't trick yourself into thinking that it's natural because it really isn't anymore. It once was, but it doesn't isn't anymore. And of course, even naturalness, people like to convince themselves it makes them safer, but um, naturalness doesn't equal safe because heroin is natural. You might know it's diethyl morphine. It comes straight from the um, opium poppy. Arsenic is natural. Strychnine is natural. Asbestos is natural. So naturalness sounds nice as a romantic notion, but frankly, in real life, doesn't help us a lot. And they say about 30 to 40% of our prescription drugs that we use throughout medicine are natural too. But do we care and does it help? Like we probably should put pictures of flowers and uh, frogs and pigs on, on the boxes and packets to confer the notion of naturalness, I suppose it would help people. Um, but you know, it doesn't make them any safer. And complementary medicine use is not irrational. You know, we understand that all individuals engage in some behaviour intended to protect their own health. I do. Everyone does. Medically sanctioned or not, objectively effective or not, especially when faced with a mortal illness or a significant chronic illness, you would just do that. Oh dear, my phone's dinging on and turned off. And um, that's been uh, recognised for a very long time, as you can see, that quote comes from 1979. And so the need to want to take more control in your life and take remedies that no health professional has condoned comes from places like dissatisfaction with mainstream medicine, the desire for autonomy, ready access. I mean, that's what's going on in pharmacy, isn't it? It's rows and rows of these products and they look so good and they look so pretty. A lot of people just feel the need, they have to try them. And I can understand that, I have too. I've, I've tried pretty much everything. Um, uh, peer pressure and fashion, that it might be that you just want to keep up with your friends and you're being pressured by the what everyone's doing to try a certain thing. 
and this idea that maybe it's uh, more compatible with a healthy lifestyle. Anyway, let's get on to things like regulation. So, oopsie. Um, uh, the problem is this is actually a multi-billion dollar industry and the Therapeutic Goods Administration does play a role in regulating all medicinal products, whether they're prescription drugs or not. Um, so even comp most complementary medicines are regulated as medicines, not as food. Uh, we can tell which ones are regulated as medicines because they make a therapeutic claim. And as therapeutic goods, they then have to be documented in the register. So we have this thing in Australia called the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, and it's a beautiful thing. It means that anyone who wants to flog a product to consumers in Australia has to be in the register. Uh, that's if they're making therapeutic claims. So the minute they start saying, good for or support eye health or help your immune system, that's a therapeutic claim and this product should be either listed or registered in, in the register. So note the two verbs to get in this big database called the ARTG. You can be either listed or registered. Now prescription drugs tend to be registered and these drugs have to submit evidence of efficacy and safety. This is what you would expect from a registered drug. So this is your prescription drugs. And it's all the nice stuff that we sort of see and read uh, when you look them up in places like MIMS or, or online or through the TGA or even like drugs.com or uh, WebMed, WebMD. Um, the thing is that a listed medicine basically promises across their heart that they do not contain any prescription drugs, that they're non um, non-scheduled we call them, they're, they're drugs with low risk and they promise across their heart that they uh, obey the uh, code of good manufacturing practice and they, get, they actually have their premises inspected which is great uh, and that they, um, but they do not have to submit any evidence of efficacy. So that's the thing we all have to understand is that these products that have an OSTL number, so they're listed in the register, have not shown anyone that they actually work. We make an assumption of safety because they do not contain prescription drugs, but that's all. So they also haven't done any testing, no testing done generally. There's some studies, but generally not like clinical trials, to say they're not gonna kill you, um, but there may be a bunch of side effects in drug interaction. Now the TGA does regular audits of listed medicines just to see whether they've complied, uh, that, that whether they're making you know, grandiose claims or, or whether they've complied with all the rules of a listed medicine. And these are the results of one of their random audits back in 2021. And they showed that 88% of the products looked at had an, uh, committed an offence. So we all need to know this too, that even though they fill in the forms and say, we promise we're a good product, a lot of them are actually pushing the envelope and making illegitimate claims or not declaring stuff or not putting warnings or the contents actually does not match what they declare on the list of contents is not actually what's in it. You also might want to know that pharmacists have an obligation to, to advise you uh, even though they you know I hope you have a good pharmacy but I know there's plenty of big yellow box pharmacies out there where you have to search quite hard to find a pharmacist. They're there legally they have to be there um, but our um, position statement from the Pharmaceutical Society and our competency standards state that we accept that consumers have the right to choose and use complementary medicines. It's not communist China. What, you know, we accept that we, we all are allowed to choose how we manage our own health. However, pharmacists must exercise the same professional judgment and have the same ob obligation to ensure you have evidence-based information and advice about those products, whether they're prescription medicines or proprietary medicines, proprietary meaning they're made by a, a drug company, and that includes complementary medicines. And that position statement also states that we believe that uh, practitioners of complementary medicine should be more, regu more regulated by government watchdogs, as well as the treatments. So we do talk about this a lot in pharmacy, so I would just want to encourage you then to approach a pharmacist and talk to them about the complementary medicines that you might be thinking of using and um, get them to fulfil their obligation, their professional obligations to you. So if we were to be, say, helping 
the lady that I did the HMR for, or if it's one of you who have a bunch of remedies at home, how do we do that review and how do we assess the risks versus the benefits? So the first step is always to take a comp what we call a comprehensive medication history, which is basically a best possible list of all the medicines, I can't spell, meds, including complementary medicines. So prescription drugs and vitamins and herbs and puffers and creams and puffers, everything that are the drugs in your life. And we have to, for, for the complementary medicines, the key thing is to actually get the brand name. Please do not identify them as I take some ginkgo or I take some ginseng. As I'm sure you're aware, there are very few complementary medicine products that have one ingredient. They mostly have 12. You know, there's always lots. Uh, and so some of those other ingredients that are above and beyond the famous ingredient or the one on the label can actually be the troublemaker ingredient. One that's very topical at the moment is vitamin B6. Uh, we have found that people experiencing toxicity from vitamin B6 overdose have largely obtained that from magnesium supplements. So they thought they were just taking magnesium, but there were these whopping great big doses of B6 in there of which they were completely unaware. And if they're taking one or two or three different forms of magnesium, the B6 very much accumulated. So we need to know the brand to be able to work out all the ingredients and not just the one that you think that it is. Uh, we will also look to see the Ostel or Ostar number because sometimes people have got illegal products or you know imported products that won't have an Ostel or Ostar number on them. We need to know how much of those things you take and uh, whether it equals what was prescribed, it could be more or less, and how long you've been on them because again, things like vitamins, minerals, their toxicity can build up over time. So the duration of the dose is very, very important. So that was step one. And with Mrs. C, the lady I did the HMR for, she was on all these um, prescription drugs, which we've already talked about. Um, but she was also on uh, quite a bit of B6, 200 milligrams twice a day, plus that which was in her magnesium. She was on um, uh, this liver detox thingy which had milk thistle but also turmeric and she didn't know there was turmeric in it in addition to the turmeric she was taking separately. And I'll just tell you now if in case I don't get to make enough of a point of it at the end, turmeric is another big controversial one at the moment because it has a significant side effect of bleeding, it has a powerful anti-platelet effect so lots of people taking it end up getting experiencing unusual bleeding and often are sitting there going, how, why, what's causing it? Because they just think, how could turmeric do that? But it's often the turmeric. And secondly, it's got a lot of drug interactions. So I had to ask this lady, you know, what is the reason you're taking these? What are you trying to achieve? Is that being achieved? And so I tried to convert her from just saying good for to, well, if it's energy, is it giving you more energy? how much energy did you want to get and how quickly, you, how long were you going to wait? Um, how much were these costing? Have you looked for side effects? What about drug interactions? And are we, by using these things, are we delaying more effective therapy? So these conversations could take a long time. Um, and so just uh, keep this also as a takeaway from tonight's presentation is, this is a great thing to ask people, by taking this complementary medicine, what are you trying to achieve? and make it concrete. The way I do it is I say, what part of your body is it helping and how is it going to change and by when? And that helps us move from the word, the abstract words like good for and oh, it's helping my well-being because what, what are they? To an actual thing you could measure because that's what we need. We need a measurable outcome. And you may have come across the need for measurable outcomes in other parts of your lives, particularly kids in uh, education at school or at university who are often encouraged to have SMART goals. So SMART goals can be applied to complementary medicines as well, that the S stands for specific, that you should have a specific goal for which you're spending money on these things. So name it, identify it, make it concrete, make it measurable and measurable. So like measure the swelling of your knee, measure the pain out of 10. Achievable, is it realistic? Or are you like hoping that one day you'll wake up, like if it was me taking something on, I said, I'd like me to, it to make me tall and blonde. It's not achievable. So it should be realistic. R is relevant. Um, 
because being tall and blonde probably isn't relevant in my life. But other things like, say, um, I don't know, uh, in, in managing musculoskeletal conditions, maybe talking about things like life extension, it, it, that'd be lovely, but is it really relevant at this time when we've got much more pressing problems? And time limited. I think it's important that people don't take products for, for years on end and then end up, when you say, is it helping? They go, oh, I think so. By having smart goals, you also have to say, how long will it take? And so things like glucosamine, we'd like people to have a time limited therapeutic trial of maybe six to eight weeks, three months maximum because the main benefit you could get from glucosamine plus or minus chondroitin would be pain management, a benefit of pain management. Uh, the other goals are now thought to be unlikely to occur, but it might help with pain. So, but don't take it for 12 months. Don't keep spending money if it's not helping. If at six and eight weeks, start getting nitpicky about is it helping? And a smarter goal is one which has been evaluated and reviewed. Um, so with magnesium, uh, this lady was taking a fair bit and uh, you might want to know that the clinical evidence and clinical trial evidence uh, for magnesium plus supplements for skeletal muscle cramps actually have shown that no benefit, interestingly, which is bizarre because so many people out there in the world take magnesium for leg cramps and swear blue, black and blue, that it works. And it's very hard to go against such powerful anecdotes. So, you know, again, I often let people give it a go, but a time-limited experiment and say, well, why don't you take it? It's unlikely to cause problems. We'll assess if there's any drug interactions and warn about the potential side effect of diarrhea and then say, give it a go for, say, two to four weeks. And if in that time it helps, yay. But if it didn't, then, you know, it's unlikely to be beneficial and don't just take it ad infinitum just in case one day you wake up and it's now helping. But this Cochrane review of magnesium supplements did suggest mainly the only people that might benefit is pregnant women. Uh, but other than that, they said that it was unlikely to be clinically meaningful. Slide. The uh, fish oil, as hopefully you know, the benefits for cardiovascular disease have now largely been lost. The um, benefit probably does exist for people who eat actual fish, but for little capsules of not fish, because we have to remember that, don't we? The benefit was seen in Eximo, Eskimos eating fish. To actually swallow some completely fake fish <laughs> oil is not the same. So we were unlikely to get the same benefit. But in the early 90s, there was some benefit for in heart disease, particularly preventing uh, cardiac arrhythmias causing sudden death. Um, but the, since then, the world has changed. It's been 20, 30 years that um, people are now uh, having much better, well-controlled cholesterol, much better controlled hypertension. And so that the amount of benefit that fish oil capsules can add in is now non-existent. So for both primary and secondary prevention of heart disease, we now don't think that fish, cap fish oil capsules do anything. However, of course, there is that potential other benefit of uh, it being anti-inflammatory. So, you know, people listening in tonight are probably mostly interested in musculoskeletal conditions. And so, um, it, 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 but you have to remember the big dose that rather large doses like six to eight, even 14 capsules a day are required to generate an anti-inflammatory effect from fish oil. And at that dose, that's when you start getting the risk of like gastrointestinal upset, taste disturbances, and of course the, the um, influence of um, potential bleeding. So. The other potential risks uh, I'm going to outline and then you weigh up them against potential benefit. So these are the six harms, adverse effects or side effects, drug interactions, cost, they're not free, delay of more effective therapy, and that's really tragic sometimes, false hope or fraud, and medication burden. That's hard to remember them all. So the mnemonic that I made up, which I now use on a day-to-day -day basis, is ABCDIF which is standing for adverse effects, burden, cost, delay, interactions, and false hope or fraud. And I'll just quickly go through each one. So adverse effects is pretty obvious. Uh, and it's this is another thing that really gets up my nose that there are a few warnings on the packet. So how if you're looking at a thing and you're thinking, oh, I might take that red clover substance for uh, treating my menopausal symptoms, or I might take that 
Garcinia substance that's supposed to give me a flat belly. Um, th but there have been lots and lots of case reports and um, accumulating evidence of uh, liver injury from a lot of menopausal uh, products containing various things, but particularly black cohosh. Um, and lots of weight loss supplements containing Garcinia have been linked with psychiatric adverse effects and particularly one to psychosis. Like, and there's nothing on the packet is there to say, warning, if you take this Garcinia, you could experience psychosis. They just don't. And so we've got to remember that there are side effects, but you have to go looking for them. You have to go do your research. Now B6, we have to make sure everybody knows about this because you need to tell your friends. The TGA has just changed the labeling on all these products because they're now much more aware of the risk from B6. Um, it mainly causes peripheral neuropathy. So you may know this already, that it's damage to the nerves in your periphery and your hands and your feet. Um, it can get so bad that people can develop core feet and uh, difficulty walking or in fact lose ability to walk completely. I hope I didn't just turn myself off. Um, the uh, dose should be, in, in the UK, dose is greater than 50 milligrams a day and our prescription drug, it's that much of a problem. They're changing it to 100 milligrams a day here in Australia and products with more than 50 milligrams will carry a warning that, that this product can, is associated with damage to nerves and if you're experiencing numbness, tingling, burning in your hands and your feet to stop taking the product. So, you know, with this lady, she was taking a huge dose, 450 milligrams a day. She did have some paresthesias, but of course that could have been lots of things, you know, could have been carpal tunnel syndrome, um, but I certainly put it in my report to her doctor. Um, now, complementary medicines with bleeding side effects, so we're still on adverse effects here. Uh, there's lots of them, and I'm gonna have to click really fast. Um, Turmeric is the one that annoys me the most because there's so much turmeric being taken as if it were the best anti-inflammatory in the world. But if you were to think about how much benefit it gave for, for pain versus the risk of bleeding, would you still feel so good about it? I, I'm not sure people would, but without being told about the bleeding risk and the drug interaction risk, it can feel like there are no adverse effects. Uh, recently I had a lady who, um, uh, it was experiencing nosebleeds on turmeric and she was just about to go and have a curatage of the inside of her nose to stop the bleeding and um, no one had ever told her that that could be from the turmeric. She stopped the turmeric and it all stopped, didn't have to have the operation. The thing I also draw your attention to is that you could be on one product but it could have six of these ingredients in them. So it might not be that you take ginger but it just happens to be in the product you're taking. And a lot of the multivitamins do this. They have vitamins and minerals, but also herbs these days. And you may not have even wanted to take herbs, but they throw them in anyway. So you just got to remember that those things have side effects, particularly bleeding. Oh, and one other thing, if you're going to have surgery, as you know, any substance medicine that you're taking that could influence bleeding must be stopped well in advance of that surgery. So you don't aggravate the bleeding risk of the surgery. So with complementary medicines, as most of them have an antiplatelet effect, they need to be stopped five to seven days before the surgery. So that's a long time. So you've really got to be on the ball to have thought about, oh yeah, I should top, stop my vitamins, I should stop my herbs. I'm not going to labour the drug interactions thing too much because I'll bore you silly and it's, it's very complicated, but there are a lot of drug interaction risks and things that you'd never think about. So there's a lot of um, interactions with green tea it's the big catechins in green tea, the epigallo uh, that can do things like block drug transporter sites, drug metabolism sites, but also block receptor sites. And this um, paper is describing that the epigallo gallates in green tea block the efficacy of this anti-cancer drug called, called bortezomib uh, and stop it from working. Now, who knew green tea could do that? And yet a lot of people actually drink green tea when they've got a cancer diagnosis because they think it has therapeutic benefit. Uh, there are interactions that stop drugs circulating around the body or getting into certain um, tissue sites. And this can be, uh, this can occur from things like fruit juice interactions. I know you all know about grapefruit, that's so last century. Apple juice, orange juice, mandarin juice, pomegranate juice, pineapple juice, they all interact too. And then things like soy isoflavones, the phytoestrogens in soy 
can also cause lots of drug interactions. Um, the uh, ingredients in brassica, the um, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, can induce uh, drug metabolism, just like St. John's wort does, or smoking does. You know, so again, and a lot of people take tablets of broccoli, that they, uh, you know, it's a concentrated form of broccoli, so you don't have to eat the broccoli anymore, hooray. Uh, but they don't put any warning of the drug interactions. Um, and this is just showing you all of the different herbs and fruits and herbal constituents that are associated with blocking a drug transporter called PGP, um, P-glycoprotein, which pumps drugs in and out of substances, in and out of cells. And all of these things uh, are potentially can get in the way and, and stop that transport. So as I said, turmeric is a particular problem because it inhibits all of these metabolic enzymes and quite strongly, and it inhibits drug transporters. And it also then is added to with the other ingredients. As you probably know, they add in black pepper, otherwise known as piperine, to a lot of turmeric products. And that also is a PGP blocker. So that there are drug interactions galore and um, it frightens me silly. So just to get to the rest of the potential risks includes cost because complementary medicines are not free. The problem is when faced with a mortal illness or a you know, serious illness, often money loses its value and people just go, I don't care how much it costs, I'm going to buy it. So I just have to always keep an eye on that, I suppose, and just make sure people aren't doing silly things like not eating because they might be sacrificing their grocery money for, you know, I had a couple once taking uh, bee pollen extract because it was a superfood and they thought that meant they didn't have to eat anymore. Um, delay of more effective therapy is things like, um, this was a terrible, tragic case of a young girl with severe depression, but the mother didn't want to try, didn't want to go medical too quickly. So she was going to use homeopathic remedies for a time. And unfortunately, her daughter committed suicide in the time while she was being treated with homeopathic drops. Whereas, you know, we we're all just going, if you'd tried antidepressants, there's a chance she could have actually got better, but we'll never know. But these are the sorts of things that can happen. Also, cancer, we see this a lot, that people get the diagnosis, um, they've got symptoms, but they go somewhere else and have microwave therapy or something, come back a year later and they've got, you know, cancer spread throughout their body and they go, can you treat me now? And, you know, often that's just too late. The drugs can't possibly treat that extensive disease. Um, medication burden is about polypharmacy. So hopefully you're all aware of that, that um, uh, taking lots of medicines. So polypharmacy typically means five or more medicines. 10 or more medicines is called hyperpolypharmacy. Uh, that once you're taking lots of medicines, it's easier to make mistakes. So what I'm saying here is that we have to include the complementary medicines into this equation. That if you're on four drugs from the doctor and four drugs from the naturopath, you're on eight drugs. So now you've got eight drugs to have to think about, to remember, to sort out, to schedule in your day. Um, and so it leads to mistakes and drug interactions and also non-adherence, which in other words, not taking them. Uh, and so to not excuse them, that they're all part of that medication burden. And finally, false hope. You know, most health professionals in the conventional health professions have it trained out of them to not offer people false hope and make false promises. But there are plenty of people out there in the big wide world who have no qualms in offering people um, false hope, which is terrible. And uh, this is a quote from this guy called Stephen Barrett, who runs the website in the United States called Quackwatch, which if you want to laugh, it's fantastic. It, it offers a very humorous but realistic approach to managing your um, people being affected by quackery or how to combat quackery. Um, so he talks about false hope for the seriously ill is the cruelest form of quackery by luring victims away from effective treatment. Those who buy false hope waste financial resources and waste time, the time they have left in fruitless pursuit of a cure. And once disappointment is realized, it may die, willowing in bitterness and guilt. So, and there's a lot of quackery around, isn't there? So we all need to be aware of that. And also it occurs in conventional medicine too. I'm not saying we're immune to it, probably in cosmetic medicine, it's the worst. So those are the six harms. And I just draw your attention to things like just a boring thing like a calcium tablet. This is a fake, I made this one up, but it, there, there are lots like this. They call themselves super calcium, 
but in de if you just actually look at the ingredients, they might not have much calcium at all. So the boring calcium tablets that we recommend most people use uh, contain about 600 milligrams of elemental calcium, but this one called super calcium only had 200. So you'd have to take, so the, the usual dose recommended is 1200 milligrams a day if you wanna help um, bone density, although it doesn't work very well we'd probably say take one. But anyway, to do the 1200 of this product, you'd have to take six a day. And my lady was only taking two. But it's got all this other stuff in it, including some vitamin B6 or pyridoxine, extracts of raspberry leaf. And luckily, no wheat, rye, barley, gluten, salt, pepper, sugar, yay. So this is why looking at the ingredients and just checking out how much is there and how much did you need to take to do a thing, to have your measurable SMART goal. And finally, de-prescribing, so that if we do see people taking lots of stuff and then you do identify that, frankly, they could stop some, probably good to apply the same principles of what we call de-prescribing to in this area as well. Uh, de-prescribing is the rational and scheduled removal of medicines from a person's life. Um, so we always start with a, a comprehensive medication review. We apply the appropriateness criteria and then we make a plan. And importantly, we try to only stop one product at a time, because sometimes when people do come off things, they do experience some withdrawal symptoms or some other unexplained symptoms. And you want to be able to clearly identify what substance had been coming and going at the time. But if you stop six substances all at once, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and some, more well, many, uh, complementary medicines contain mood altering ingredients. And so, because you might then get a destabilization of mood by stopping them, it's another reason to ensure gradual withdrawal and, and close monitoring. And we do encourage people to keep a diary when they're doing this. So with Mrs. M, she was Mrs. C before, uh, <laughs> we went through all of hers and you know, some of them I said she could keep taking, uh, like the glucosamine, I said, you know, you reckon it helps, that's great. Well, I reckon you should stay on it for the time being. But how about keep a closer eye on it for the time, for the next little period of time and then you can review it again. But things like the liver detox, just so you know, most things that detox, uh, particularly if they're going to say it about your liver, are laxatives. But they're actually doing nothing at all for your liver because your liver cleans itself. But they're mostly just stimulating people's bowels with things like aloe vera and um, extracts from prunes and cascara, which are well-known stimulant laxatives. Uh, and if, the, if you want some resources, these are some good ones. My favourite is the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre or MSKCC. They have a database available to the world, full text, fully referenced, called About Herbs and it's magnificent. Uh, so I really recommend you use that resource to look things up, to read up about what, uh, they put things about efficacy there and what's established and substantiated, but they also outline potential adverse effects and drug interactions really, really well. Uh, Drugs.com is a website, it's actually the consumer arm of the FDA, and it's actually very good, it's got ads on it, so it looks a bit, I don't know, commercial, but actually it's very good. Um, PubMed is where you might look up um, uh, literature articles, published articles, peer reviewed, so that's always worthwhile having a look at. Um, the National Library of Medicine is in the United States and part of those National Institutes of Health and there's one for complementary medicine. They write some great reviews of different remedies, including things like glucosamine. And Quack Watch, just, just have a look at that because I think a lot of people would benefit just um, some of the little skills it can give you, like how to spot quackery. They're excellent. So in summary, um, complementary medicines are mostly pharmaceutically manufactured medicines. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry, so don't feel sorry for them. Uh, to work out if things are safe, you should weigh up the benefit versus the risk and make sure that the benefit outweighs the risk. But to do that, you've got to quantify both. How do you do that? Well, you've got to do your research. And finally, um, aim for quality use of complementary medicines and ask lots of questions. And I'm very happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. Geraldine, that was um, just so interesting and look so important because like we all, and, and as you sort of said at one point in your presentation, it's very much about um, in a way, uh, you know, uh, patients, consumers wanting to take a bit of control, uh, you know, in the situation where they have an illness or they have a, a chronic health condition and so on. 
Um, but as you pointed out, you know, with traditional medicines and with complementary medicines, uh, there's there's good and bad bad aspects of both. But the thing that really sort of stuck in my mind from your presentation was the fact that there's just not the same information that comes with the complementary medicines, um, which really hi highlights the main concern with them. And I have to say, I was also very surprised with the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. So that was interesting about the difference between the, a listed product and a registered product. Um, so even for people listening tonight, I think that will be very interesting information and your uh, sources and um, places to go for further information, I think will be a great benefit for people. Um, so I've got a range of questions myself, but there are a couple of other questions that have come through. So we'll run mm -hmm. through them. If people have uh, any questions to ask, please put them in the question box now, because we've only got about um, eight minutes before we finish up, um, which is fine because the, the presentation just contains so much information. Uh, just reminding everyone that the recording will be available, be sent out to everyone who registered and available freely on our website. So you can let friends and family um, know as well about uh, the recording. Um, someone asked, what, what if your doctor suggests complementary medicines such as calcium, vitamin B and so on? Um, you know, I, I suppose that's fine. What, what, what would you say to a person where, where someone's doctor is actually recommending um, additional supplementary medicines? Well, I would suggest you follow exactly what we've talked about tonight. Firstly, establish what the therapeutic objective is. Like, you're not supposed to just take them for the fun of it, are you? Uh, what is the therapeutic objective? What are we supposed to be achieving by taking those things? Because generally vitamin Bs do nothing at all unless you're vitamin B deficient but just taking supplementary vitamins is unnecessary in a beautifully well-nourished advanced country like Australia. Uh, so, you know, you really have to be in a concentration camp for a couple of months to, to become deficient enough to require taking them. So why did they want you to take them for and what will it, where will it take you? Then, um, and make those goals smart. So I talked about smart goals. So be specific, make it measurable, make it achievable and time related. Like calcium, Generally speaking, we don't recommend calcium supplements anymore for osteoporosis management because it's now associated with accumulation of calcium in your blood vessels and also risk of you know, calcium um, kidney stones. And you can get most of it from your diet. And vitamin D is the key thing there because it, without the vitamin D, your calcium can't get into your cells. It's like a bridge to help absorption. So we do want people to do vitamin D replete but generally probably don't need the calcium. But if you get, what we tell people to do is look at your day, see how much you ate, what you ate. And if you didn't get about a thousand milligrams of calcium in your food, then you can go, well, maybe I should take one. And you just take it at the end of the day. And that way you can know that day you had plenty, enough calcium that your bones will have enough to do their job. Um, so mm. see how we're being really specific, really nitpicky. Mm. Now, Geraldine, an interesting question here. Do you have any recommendations for European sites for people to follow up with? Um, the comment that they sometimes tend to be less, um, have less susceptibility to influence and a higher standard than the US uh, sites that you recommended. What's your comment about that? Oh, I think that's an awfully broad brush. I mean, in general, there's much less regulation of complementary medicines in the US such a huge country and 300 million people and so much more sort of commercial commercialized commercialization of uh, complementary medicines in the united states and and less regulate i mean it's virtually chaos in the united states the fda struggles to do their job with prescription drugs let alone looking after anything to do with complementary medicine so that is a weakness of the american system um, but honestly i think dodgy websites are everywhere and so you can't judge anything by where it's coming from because after all we know that in Europe there's always been a bit of a romance about natural remedies and herbally things and that particularly in Germany they used to teach herbal medicine in every medical course and I think a lot of that was just supported because it just sort of sounded nice and so, um, not because there was necessarily good evidence or um, you know clear efficacy versus risk so I think we just need to apply the standards we were talking about tonight be nitpicky and make sure you quantify benefit and quantify risk for anything you take or anything you read about, no matter what you're reading. Mm. And why is the wellness industry so focused on particular ingredients like B6 
and added to so many products, especially when it's a known neurotoxin? Very good question. Goodness me. I think um, that because they can and people, can, if they were to read about vitamin B6, they'd read about it being involved in, say, the regulation of vitamin B12, B6 and folate and generation of red blood cells, also cardiovascular health. There was a time there where every cardiologist was recommending that people take B12, B6 and folate and they would never die. <laughs> uh, it was even touted as a prevention of dementia and also prevention of macular degeneration. Well, time has shown that none of those things actually happen. There's no benefit from those supplements. Um, so, I think people have just thought it sounds good and so they throw it in the product. There was one manufacturer based here in Queensland years ago who admitted to me that his wife made up the formulae. She had no training in health at all. She was his secretary, but they ended up getting married and he put her in charge of identifying what conditions out there people wanted to treat. That's what they'd put on the bottle and then she'd make up what ingredients would go in there. So, you know, often there's no science in their choosing their ingredients and they just know that it's a thing that people might look for and they go, oh, that sounds good and they'll buy it and that's all they care about. Mm. <clears throat> there's a question about collagen. I'm not sure if collagen comes under the sort of the banner of complementary um, medicine. Um, just a question about of three types of collagen. I've read oh, that God. type two is supposed, to, is supposed to be good for joint comfort and function. Is good this for. true? So is collagen... The, yeah, yeah. Yes, if you're going to make a therapeutic claim, such as, I don't know, AIDS in the something, something of uh, connective tissue in a joint, that's a therapeutic claim, isn't it? So any product saying that would be regulated as a therapeutic good, uh, that's not a prescription mm -hmm. drug, so it would be able to be marketed as a listed medicine. I have not seen any clinical trials, but I don't see every clinical trial, obviously, there's hundreds of millions and thousands of them. Uh, but it's unlikely that it will actually work because, after all, collagen is just a polypeptide. It's, you know, form of almost a protein and a bunch of amino acids. So when you consume it, it just breaks up into the amino acids and disappears. It's not going to know, I know, I'll go to your joints. I'll work there. As a lot of people would know, collagen supplements are being used a lot in the beauty industry. People take collagen drinks because they think it's going to help the collagen in their skin. Well, how do they know it's going to go to their skin rather than their joints? Well, not just straight out. Also, people don't think about the origin of the collagen that they're consuming, and a lot of it's a bit like glucosamine and chondroitin, that it's like connective tissue obtained from dead animals. Uh, a lot of glucosamine is acquired from the abattoirs, um, from cattle when they break them up into meat, the necks are left over and the, um, connect the collagen in their neck is used for the connective tissue in the neck is used for um, making glucosamine. So, as well as it coming from seafood, I'm sure you're all aware that, and so people with seafood allergies have to, shellfish allergies have to avoid that. So look, I, I think it's a scam. I think it's just um, people not knowing enough about chemistry and not understanding that, it, you know, a, a polypeptide like that is just gonna break up in your stomach and probably just disappear. There are a couple of questions about folic acid, about medicinal mushrooms and about cannabinoids. But basically, I, I think your response to that would be to sort of follow the advice you've given tonight. One last question before we finish up, though. How would someone get a medicines review uh, if they wanted to actually get local pharmacists or whatever to actually... Can anyone just ask for a medicines review, Geraldine? For the pharmacist to be paid for that service, they need to have a referral from your GP. So um, yeah, talk to your GP and make sure they understand that it's not the, not the pharmacist checking up on their prescribing, it's reviewing your medicines and how you're going with your medicines in the home. Uh, so it's about mm. you and, and the home. Uh, and yeah, so we need that piece of paper from the GP to be able to submit to get paid. Okay, and look, uh, that's um, uh, really worthwhile, but I, I think the thing that's really important is, and of course that review would need to include any prescri prescribed medicines and any complementary medicines, and oh, totally. even I've realised the importance of actually, of, uh, it's all part of, they're all drugs, as you say, so um, it's really that whole package which people need to consider. Look, we're right on 8pm, so we are going to finish there. Geraldine, that was so interesting, and I'm sure this recording will be watched many times because we know that we get many inquiries at Musculoskeletal Australia about complementary medicines, 
And I believe that this webinar really will assist people in really trying to just, as you say, weigh up the benefits and the risks. Um, and Excellent. I think it's just been so informative and, and uh, worthwhile information for us to have this evening. I'd like to thank you again. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined this evening and just remind people to, um, to uh, fill in the exit survey uh, as uh, that will come on your screens when we shut down the webinar this evening. So on that note, I will wish you all a very good night. Thank you. Good night.